Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, I would like to call uh, the Marcus Vineyard Museum annual meeting to order. I think, first of all, I would like to make a few remarks about what has happened uh, this last year. It's been a quite a remarkable year. Uh, it's been a remarkable year because it really marks an important moment in the evolution of this institution that was founded as the Duke County Historical Society in 1923, later named the Marcus Vineyard Historical Society, and finally the Marcus Vineyard Museum. The museum is grown from the Historical Society to a museum with a very active program of research, community outreach, lectures, film presentations, publications, and exhibits. It is a program that has reached out to schools. It has reached to every community on the island, especially in this last year. And now, with modern technology, Laura Jernigan's diary is available to audiences not only nationwide, but worldwide. But still, the museum's ability to fulfill its mission has been compromised by the fact that our current Equitown location does not provide us with adequate space for collection storage, exhibitions, public programs, or parking. The museum, as you many of you know, has contemplated several sites for its new home. But none of them were deemed adequate to meet the museum's needs. The site in West Tisbury was deemed not to be a central location to attract visitors, and the Edgartown School was not large enough to meet the needs of the new museum. In 2010, the museum was presented with an extraordinary opportunity to consider the feasibility of the Marine Hospital property site for its new home. As you know, the Marine Hospital property is in Vineyard Haven, uh, overlooking Vineyard right off the Blue Pond Road. The feasibility study concluded that the 4.4 acre site was large enough to accommodate the museum's needs and seemed to fit well into the museum's mission to, re to uh, put to adaptive use the historic Marine Hospital building. Additional attributes of the property were the proximity of the Vineyard Haven Ferry and the site's spectacular view of Vineyard Haven Harbor. After encouraging meetings with the neighbors abutting the property, Vineyard Haven selectmen, the planning board, and others, the museum obtained a second option on the land in order to have time to raise the funds needed to acquire the property. The necessary funds were raised, and the purchase and sale agreement has been signed, and we expect to close at the end of this month. At the same time, the museum is in the process of negotiating a purchase and sale agreement to sell West Tisbury, the West Tisbury land, to two adjacent neighbors, the Poly Hill Arboretum, and the Martins Vineyard Agricultural Society. A new era for the museum has begun. It is an exciting time. In closing, I simply would like to recognize, in particular, the staff for their very hard work and their professionalism. Without their loyal dedication, the museum's ambitious program would not have been accomplished. Also, there were scores of loyal volunteers who put in hours and hours of service. They had answered phone calls, worked at the museum shop, welcomed visitors to the museum campus, guided visitors to the cook house, skippered the vanity. We were most grateful to each and every volunteer. Their commitment has been invaluable. And I also would like to thank my fellow 
board members. Without their um, uh, dedication to serving and giving their time to the board, and I must tell you, it was many, many hours, because we had to have uh, two special board meetings this year because of the uh, decisions that we had to make on feasibility studies and moving forward. In addition, the board members, plus others in this room, have served on the committees who have been very active this uh, past year, and in particular, the planning committee. So I just wish to thank you all. And without your support, I'm afraid uh, this ambitious undertaking that we have taken on would not have happened. So I am most grateful to you all. So now I would like to ask for the approval of the minutes of the annual meeting 2010. Are there any additions or corrections? All in favor to adopt the minutes as they are read on the website. I hope you will see them. Uh, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, therefore, the minutes uh, for the 2010 annual meeting have passed. Uh, David? Good afternoon. This is my second annual meeting as executive director. And although I've not, uh, although I've actually attended three, in August 2009, I was here as your director designate. Uh, as with past meetings, I'll start with sincere appreciation for making 2010 a successful year to the staff. And I'd like to have them stand as a group and be acknowledged. Exhibition website. 
the show came and went, but the website continues to get prizes from library and museum associations, and it is building our regional, national, and indeed international reputation. Our impact in the vineyard school system began dramatically to increase in the fall of 2010. And with support from the Bulgaria Charitable Trust, and with two years left on the grant, we have the opportunity to keep it moving dramatically forward. In academic 2010-11, we tripled the number of children served. Collections, the second strategic area, is an often less obvious or sexy strategy to, to follow, was an important part of our forces uh, in 2010. Our May 2010 curatorial reorganization brought us Bonnie Stacy. She came from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and many of us say she has made miraculous contributions the way some others have done from towns known as Bethlehem. She looks good when she turns red, too. <laughs> Behind the scenes, we have a new and improved collections policy and are on our way to getting our archives and objects in a more robust digital database. The Board of Collections Committee has a new enthusiasm and it is helping the full board to be regularly reminded that the things that we have in storage now will make this institution worthy of support for generations to come. A third strategic operating objective is looking to widen our audiences through more inclusive and accessible offerings. In 2010, we started having programs off campus, such as films and Vineyard Haven. Uh, and off island, such as winter meetings in Boston, New York, and Florida. It appears to have worked in that attendance was higher for programs and admissions at the museum and the lighthouses were better than any previous records in 2010. Also, in dollar amount, annual fund contributions were higher than all but one previous year. They were up 90% in 2010. The annual meeting is required by our bylaws in order to report to you, our members. You are our most committed audience. You want a closer association with us. You value what we do and what we hold. You look forward to the Messenger newsletter and are devoted readers of the Dukes County Intelligentsia. We appreciate your support and need to make sure that your group stays healthy and active. Like other small museums and seasonal communities who profi whose profile is changing from a history museum to a more broad-based museum, we are finding it harder to get your friends and neighbors to join us. Please help by introducing the museum to these people and bring them into the museum family. We appreciate and need your help. Uh, in preparing my remarks, I looked at prior annual report, and I made a comment last year, and I'd like to repeat it today. Growing our staff, growing our programming, growing our service to members and new audiences are not easy to do. In a poor economy, they require some short-term sacrifice and better teamwork, unquote. I close by saying that we are all on the same team, and you play a very important position in helping us to win. Thank you. And now I will uh, take off my director hat and put on my uh, hat uh, as a member of the Finance Committee ex officio. Uh, our treasurer could not be with us today. He had another commitment. Uh, but Paul Watts of Edgar County National Bank stepped forward uh, about two months ago to become uh, treasurer and has been very, very helpful. Uh, again, in the end report on the details uh, in terms of the operating statement as well as a fuller explanation, but I'll just highlight the operating results. They were much better than in 2009. However, in 2010, we still had a loss of $83,000. In 2009, our loss was 171000 And a loss of any amount is not good enough. And we are working hard in 2011 to get much closer to break even or even better. However, the economic environment right now <laughs> is not in our favor. Uh, the past 10 days in the financial markets takes a toll on feelings of optimism. 
Last year we spent money to make money. We increased expenses 23% and revenue went up by 38%. That was good news. And indeed we did find areas where it was clearly connected, the spending and the making. We have followed a similar financial strategy this year. The printed annual report has the details for 2010. Calling attention to the most significant news, it's really in contributions and special events. They were lower in 2009 from 2008. They started to come back up in 2010. We raised $300,000 in contributions in the final quarter of last year. And we did that with a two-for-one challenge grant that the Development Committee under Sheldon Hackney orchestrated. We are facing a similar goal this year for year-end giving. I'm happy to try to answer any questions that you might have before we move on to the next order of business. No questions? Elizabeth. This is the time of the meeting where we would like to for the names of the for election to the board of the following individuals. And if you were here, it would be good if you'd stand up. Marsha Mulford Sidney, James Curtis, Jim Richardson, Paul Watts, as we uh, has a commitment today, is not here, and Elizabeth Hawes Weinstock. So I would like to ask if I could have a vote uh, from the membership for these new individuals to be elected to the board of directors. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. And now I also, um, we have a, a bylaw amendment. It's very small, but I need to bring it to your attention. Uh, the museum the directors are preparing, are proposing a clarification to Article 2 of the museum's bylaws. Uh, the revised mission statement would read as follows, with changes in bold italics. Article 2, mission. The Martha's Vineyard Museum is dedicated to furthering an interest in, experience of, and appreciation for the history and the culture of the island and its environments. In order to achieve these goals, the museum will mount exhibitions on a variety of topics, present collaborative education programs, actively involve the people of Martha's Vineyard, support scholarly research, preserve and add to its museum, library, and archival collections. Any questions? Again, all in favor? Yes. Where is the change on this one? Just the preserve language or the Correct. Okay. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Now we move on to a very important part of our meeting. Three years ago, uh, when I came on board, we had a discussion uh, at the board uh, thinking it would be a there's so many people in our Martha's Vineyard community uh, who have contributed substantially to uh, the culture of the island. Either we have authors, we have artists, historians, and so on. And they've made a tremendous contribution. And we felt that the annual meeting uh, would give us an opportunity to recognize them. And so we have three uh, medals that we would like to give today. And I would first like to call on Jim Richardson uh, to make an introduction of one of the metal nominees. Good evening and, uh, and welcome. This is a great event and I uh, know Marion Halpern for a long time. <laughs> but when you know somebody for a long time, you don't really know who they are. But so I sat down with Marion and said, who are you? And what has your career been like you know, over the uh, over the years? Um, and I just kept thinking and commenting when I was speaking with her. I said, "Oh, I didn't know that. Wow, I didn't know that. That's fantastic." Oh, man. So uh, what I'd like to do is is tell you about. I didn't know that. She grew up in East Aurora, New York, uh, near Buffalo, and went to the University of Rochester, where she uh, had a 
degree in uh, art history. She then found employment at the Albright Gallery in Buffalo, now the Albright Knox, a very famous place for a number of different reasons. But there was a director there and a curator um, who later uh, became, one of them became the uh, director of the MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, the other assistant director of the National Gallery in Washington, sort of getting company. And they recognized immediately that, that Marion uh, had something special to offer uh, to the museum field and the profession and urged her to go on to graduate study, which she did. She went to Radcliffe um, and received an MA uh, in museums. And, um, from there, she went back to the, to the Albright and then began, uh, be, uh, began a 12 year uh, um, period where she was employed by various uh, institutions and uh, museums, including Wheaton College, where she indicated that uh, she taught in the basement of the chapel, and they were almost practicing the organ upstairs, so the tendency sort of was drowned out. Uh, but uh, then she moved on uh, from uh, Wheaton College um, to the Montclair Art Museum as the assistant director, and then to the Baltimore Museum of Art, uh, very well known institutions. Um, and then the Memorial Art Gallery at the University of Rochester. She also then went to New York, uh, and she was with the Rockefeller uh, Foundation uh, for a while. She obviously got married to Sam uh, Halpern. And one, when you go through these sorts of uh, discussions about where we've been uh, and so forth, uh, how did you get to the painting? Well, it was through Sam Halpern, uh, who had suffered on office, but he didn't read it. And so they soon came here in 1964, running on the <coughs> And at that point, during the end of that particular vacation, uh, uh, Mary said, boy, we've got to buy the place here, and which they did, on um, the Blue Pond in Ben Hayden, where she still, uh, she still resides. Um, while in New York, she received her teaching degree and, and taught uh, uh, fourth and fifth grade. And on one of these sojourns, we take school kids to, uh, to museums, which she did uh, with that sort of background. And she went to the American Museum of Natural History, and at that museum there were individuals interfaced with the school groups, and so she asked the individual uh, um, who she was working with, uh, how do you get a job? And they said, well, you apply to the New York City Board of Education. And she said, what do you mean? He says, well, we're placed at the American Museum and other museums in the city by the Board of Education to interface with school groups um, and do in service uh, uh, to teaching uh, to teachers. And so she applied for a position and got a call just before she was coming down on vacation uh, to the Vayner um, and said I couldn't come because I was uh, had an interview because obviously I was coming to the Vayner. And this lady said, no problem, I have a place on the beer too, I'll interview her on the day. So she came, uh, interviewed, and uh, received an appointment uh, for which it lasted about five years to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the, uh, where she was the Board of Education in New York uh, interface. Uh, and the other great thing she had was, a, was free parking, I think. It was pretty neat. <laughs> In uh, 1971, she came to the Vineyard uh, full time, uh, Sam retired, and did a lot of volunteering uh, at the New Town Historical Society, where she uh, was involved in developing the catalog and the uh, inventory of collections. Um, she then was elected to the Board of, uh, of Directors. Uh, she was Secretary and Officer of the Board. And in 1985, when the former director, Tom Gordon, left, uh, she applied and, and uh, was made the director of the museum. And this was the first director of the museum. All the previous uh, individuals who, in fact, were the head of the museum were called curators. Um, and she's, and Mary really is the one who really professionalized the museum. Uh, didn't have much of a staff. She indicated the budget was $85,000 a year. You would probably make that, you know, pretty easy to do. But, uh, um, and uh, she very soon had his staff, uh, a 
curator, um, a development person later on for uh, capital campaign. Uh, librarian was already there, uh, but there were some changes in, in, in those areas. Uh, membership, uh, financial person, and so forth and so on. So she moved from a staff of about three, and then she uh, left the museum in 1992. There were, there were six, and the museum was really not a very firm footing. During that period, a very short period of time, the uh, Jerry Boost House in, in Wiener Haven was purchased um, for the Tisbury Museum. Tony Van Riper was uh, involved with that, and uh, also involved with purchasing the Peace House. So there was a lot of activity going on with uh, incorporating two more facilities uh, into the uh, uh, museum's uh, program. Um, she, in fact, got the first computers for staff members, uh, Art Railton, uh, for example, and for funding finance and membership. And as everybody well knows, uh, she got involved with transcribing uh, uh, Charles Vincent's uh, Civil War Diary, which was just published by uh, Charlie Mack uh, in 2008. Took her about 10 years. And she's on the way now with another series of diaries on Rebecca and Anna Smith, who uh, diaries go from 1813 to 1824, but it covers the War of 1812, so that should be another exciting, uh, exciting going. And she indicated uh, uh, to me, and she's done this to others, that uh, the publication of Charlie Mack was really a gift back to the museum, which had meant so much to her uh, uh, since she arrived in the vineyard. Now, just one last uh, uh, comment. Uh, her community service is been quite extraordinary, uh, obviously a museum service. She's been at a museum as a professional for 27 years uh, before uh, she founded up the Office uh, the Museum in 1992. Um, she was involved, involved in a wide range of Martha's Vineyard community programs, uh, president of Martha's Vineyard Hospital, Hospital Auxiliary, ex officio on the board of the, uh, of the hospital, volunteer for the years, uh, for 30 years at the Tisbury Historical Commission. And in 1983, for all the involved in community affairs, uh, she was given the Creative Living Award um, with Stan Lowe, who was uh, in the, the first two recipients uh, of this series, the current endowment month has been um, Later on, David McCullough, Arthur Wall, uh, and others uh, were also awarded. She's now in the process of donating property for uh, affordable housing, uh, adjacent to her property. Uh, so she still maintains a, a very uh, strong uh, commitment to, to community service. So please uh, um, join me in, in celebrating and honoring Mary, who uh, not only is a, a, a museum professional, an author, a communicator, closer to the woman, can't go sailor, uh, for our contributions to the bigger life and history. Thank you. Labor 
You can almost feel somebody picking up a pen and writing in a very simple fashion. The letter is written from Barnstable, and the date is 1704, more than 300 years ago. It begins, Honored Mother, I would like to present my affection to you and my regards to Mr. Smith, where I hope everyone is feeling well, as all of us are here, except for myself. And for a long time, I have felt pain, great pain, and weariness. I put my hand, my faith in the hands of the Lord, and I pray for patience in accepting his solution. What I really would like is a visit from you and your good company. But I know it can't happen because of the reason of the season and the very cold weather, cold water between us. So I ask for your prayers and, again, help in my patience in accepting the future. Signed, your daughter, Ruth Bacon. Now, Ruth isn't a very common vineyard girl's name, and Bacon is not a usual vineyard name. But one of the things about the museum is that the library is just full of ways to answer questions you might have. Who was she? Who was her mother? Why was she sick? And what happened to her? Among many, many, many other questions. For me, that letter raises. And the only real clue, or clue to where I began uh, in the letter, was Mr. Smith. And it turns out among the first of 25 proprietors is the Samuel Smith. If you look at what genealogists tell us about him, he had married, not uh, just a few years before this letter was written, he had ma married the widow of Thomas Daggett. Her name was Hannah Daggett. And if you check on Thomas Daggett, you'll find that the Hannah he married was Hannah Mayhew, Thomas Mayhew's first daughter, the first of four he had. Thomas Daggett and Hannah May and Hannah Mayhew Daggett had ten children, and the tenth was named Ruth. So we begin to understand that she was writing home to her mother, Hannah Daggett, daughter of Thomas Mayhew. If you look a little more, you can discover that four of Tom, three of four of Thomas Mayhew's four daughters all married off island. Hannah was not the first, but she married. Uh, Nicholas Baker, who lived in Barnstable, in which she had written the letter. And if you look at the, a little more in the records about that family, you'll find that the letter was written on the 6th of January, 1704, and on the 15th, they, their first daughter, named Hannah, arrived. Uh, she, if you want to know what happened to her, she lived to have another daughter, and actually she didn't die until she was 80. This is the kind of thing that really can get under my skin and make me feel that I have walked in somebody else's shoes. And I hope in your next visit to the museum that you will find something that does exactly the same thing to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to call on uh, Ann Smith and Janet Smith Gomez. Good evening. Ann and I are so pleased to be introducing our mother to you, Francine Kelly, this evening. Ever since we can remember, Mom's been a champion of and for the arts. Francine credits the strong influence of her mother, a physician, musician, and artist, who introduced her to organ music, painting, and the theater. Francine broadened her exposure of the arts at Oberlin College, where she graduated with a degree in history and international government. Her extensive worldwide travel, including living in Alper, Turkey, in Basel, Switzerland, in Basel, Switzerland, um, further increased her love of art. Francine has a great eye and finds the best art gifts for her family and friends. Our homes are filled with treasures from around the world, including Persian rugs, brass and copper samovars, woven camel saddles, and Brookwood pottery from Francine's hometown of Cincinnati, Ohio. 
We now delight in finding mom's favorite collectibles of teapots, perfume atomizers, atomizers, royal Copenhagen holiday plates, and lapis lazuli jewelry. And then there's her love for people of all ages, which combined with her love of art, create the core energy of mom's full life. Francine began teaching history, social studies, and economics to middle and high schoolers early in her career in Cincinnati, Ohio. And after becoming the mother of four daughters, Francine became a major civic volunteer in Indianapolis, Indiana. We can remember my mom patiently counseling young moms in how to care for their children at the Indianapolis Parent-Child Development Center. She nurtured young political candidates in both parties, she served as a docent at the Indianapolis Museum of Art, served on the boards of the Indianapolis Art Center, Young Audiences, and Very Special Arts. She was a member of the Indianapolis Chapter of Lynx and the Coalition of 100 Black Women. Francine shared many fundraisers and her special events and parties for her cherished causes are memorable, even legendary, in the Indianapolis community. Francine served as the Director of Programs at the Indianapolis Children's Museum, the world's largest children's museum, from 1986 to 2000. She created thousands of innovative programs for children of all ages and managed a staff of over 20 programmers. She became the Director of Community Initiatives in 2000 in a groundbreaking role of using the Children's Museum influence to revitalize the surrounding neighborhood creating partnerships with Lilly Endowment, the Community Development Council, Neighborhood Resource Centers, and Habitat for Humanity. She is a master networker and builds strong relationships, and she retired from the Indianapolis Children's Museum in February of 2003. How did Mom come to the vineyard? Francine first came to Martha's Vineyard in 1951. She has summered on the island since. Francine loves the island, and knew that this is where she would retire. And while we all believed that Francine was fulfilling her dream to retire to the island in March 2003, we were not at all surprised to learn that on April 1st, 2003, she was named the Executive Director of Featherstone Center for the Arts, its first paid Executive Director. One full month of retirement. <laughs> Francine has always encouraged artists and promoted the arts. She is an art collector, art dealer, but most importantly, an art supporter. So why would anything change in retirement? During her tenure at Featherstone, Francine increased the number of gallery shows as well as the class offerings and initiated collaborations with numerous organizations, including Marcus Vineyard Community Services, especially the Head Start Program, Holly Hill, Marcus Vineyard Museum, and The Yard. She is particularly proud of Featherstone's five-year partnership with the Marcus Vineyard Regional High School, where each March, Featherstone showcases high school art for the entire month, providing these students the opportunity to present their artwork in a professional setting, prepare their portfolios for college, and ready them for future art experiences. Mentoring the next generation of artists is one of Francine's strongest passions. Francine has truly fulfilled Featherstone's mission of a year-round community center for the arts, creating a welcoming and inspiring environment for all and nurturing personal relationships with island artists. Known for never saying no and dubbed the queen of collaboration, Francine has truly built through the arts of Featherstone, has truly built community through the arts of Featherstone. From year-round art classes for children and adults, to more than 15 gallery shows each year, to musical Mondays with island musicians and bands, to the sixth annual Flea and Fine Arts Markets with Judy McConnell featuring 70 vendors each Tuesday in the summertime, to the Art of Flowers show with Holly Alamo each Mother's Day, to the sixth annual Summer Poetry Festival with Fan Ogilvy, Justin Aaron, and America's favorite poets, including Billy Collins, to the 8th Annual Art Chocolate Festival with Malcolm and Jean Campbell during Columbus Day weekend, to the 9th Annual Holiday Gift Show featuring over 60 artists in November and December, Francine has supported Vineyard Artists 12 months of the year. Francine retired as Executive Director this past Labor Day 2010. She is consulting and leading Featherstone's 15th anniversary celebration this year. 
Francine is the Oak Bluffs appointee to the MBTV board and the Martha's Vineyard Cultural Council. She is a board member of the Oak Bluffs Association and the Save the Moment Della Harvin Day Committee. She has served as a judge at the All Island Art Show. Francine was instrumental in drafting the art section of the Martha's Vineyard Commission's Island Plan. As we move around the island, many approach us to let us know just how special our mom is. She is described as the mayor of Martha's Vineyard for creating an interconnected web of people of all ages and all occupations. In essence, a community family. Francie is a connector. When she meets you, she genuinely wants to know everything about you. What makes you tick so that, that she can then support you and connect you to others in her network to help you realize your dreams. A dear friend said that Francine works hard for everybody and motivates you to do your best for you. And you do not want to disappoint Francine if you have promised to do something. We have lived with that accountability all of our lives. <laughs> what we are most proud of is the fact that Francine is the advocate for the next generation of young children, especially her grandchildren, who have ambitions to be artists. So she creates the environment for them to be successful and everyone else here on Martha's Vineyard. Congratulations, Mom, on a much-deserved honor. We are so proud to be your daughters, and we love you. For you have truly supported the fine arts, the performing arts, literature, education, throughout your life and on Marcus Vineyard. Congratulations. collaborations, 
um, not only with the high school, but with the museum. Uh, I worked with, with uh, Lindsay Lee. I don't know if Lindsay's here today, I don't know if they saw her. But Lindsay worked with me to bring an absolutely gorgeous exhibit to uh, Featherstone, and that was uh, Lois Myron Jones' early textile exhibit. And that was one of the most successful exhibits that Featherstone has had. Also, I came up with the bright idea of having uh, a program for youngsters for, for vineyard families so that they could explore um, the different cultural institutions on the vineyard. And so Nancy Coles, is she here? Nancy wrote a wonderful grant for that collaboration and we uh, partnered with um, Polly Hill, the museum, uh, the Farm Institute, Felix Neck and the Yard and Featherstone so that youngsters could uh, come to experience each of those cultural uh, facilities here on Martha's Vineyard. Many parents of those youngsters that took part in that did not even, had not even been to any of those institutions. So that was really a wonderful collaboration, which we did twice, and we wanted to perhaps do it again. We're going to try for that again as a, as a collaboration. Um, we've had partnerships with Windermere, the charter school. We even had a birthday party for Pete Seeger on our campus. Um, we've had wonderful musical festivals. We've had jazz and Cape Verdean music. Uh, we've had, um, and Marla Blakey has uh, collaborated with us to bring those. To, there's Marla back there too. <laughs> um, we've had wonderful board support. And I, I feel kind of uh, really humble to stand here and say what I have accomplished as preserving um, the culture and arts and so forth of the vineyard because it's been with the support of wonderful board members like um, Nancy Kingsley over there, Charlie Harp, I see, Marsha and Bill Randall. I don't know if I see any other board members. Gail Ferris right here. Denny. I was going to get to Denny because Denny hired me. <laughs> 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 So, uh, oh, and, and Andrea is back there too. So it's the board members. Look at the board support to, that I have to come out to, to see me receive this honor. But some other things too that I'd like to mention we have a wonderful ladder at Featherstone, which is given to us and donated to us by uh, Claudia Miller, who you probably know in this neighborhood because of the point play. And she's done wonderful. She's offered the point way to all the visiting artists that come to Featherstone and to come to the museum too, I imagine. And um, so can you imagine an artist coming to you and saying, I'm not long for this world, but I would love a beautiful memorial garden to be at Featherstone because it has been so meaningful to me as an artist. And I want to, to be remembered at Featherstone. And that was gone really, and we had a wonderful dedication going to, to her memory and to her artistry and to her love of, of the arts and Featherstone. So it's, um, we also have a sculpture garden. I say it's not as grand and wonderful as the, the Cornville sculpture garden, but it's a start, and maybe at some point the new generation will carry it forward and make it a decor of a sculpture garden uh, importance. And coming from the Children's Museum background, I really tried to support MBTV's efforts and work with Denny to um, provide television production skills to young people. Uh, that's my primary interest at MBTV, is to see to it that, uh, that we have carry on that knowledge to young people. I also work hard to promote and support the businesses in Oak Bluffs, the Oak Bluffs Association. But we did some fun things at Featherstone too. And one of the most recent ones was our, our garden tea party fashion show, in which I saw one of your staff people, Miss Anna Carringer, <laughs> who was the star model. And uh, so you see, I have lots of connections with the museum. And the museum has done a lot to help and support us 
and our fun things and our serious things and our artistic endeavors. So I'd like to thank you and Gail, uh, who is a co-director, director for, for Featherstone and director for the museum, uh, for your support. And I hope that all of you, if you did not come on Saturday to our 15th birthday party, that you will come for our other events of uh, poetry readings and chocolate festivals and all the wonderful artistic programs that we have in which we really support uh, the vineyard artists who love to come to Featherstone and to continue the community of the arts. We are a true community. If you were here on Saturday, you would have seen families go work and, and taking part in all the arts programs that we have to offer. So thank you to all of those people that I have mentioned and all of those who have supported Featherstone. And now everyone knows where Featherstone is. <laughs> everyone knows my name, you know that? Thank you.
actually a heavy failure to, um, to attend college. Uh, Bailey, had, I think, at one point considered a life at sea. Um, Bailey was very interested in uh, going to the Naval Academy, but unfortunately, uh, during his physical examination, they determined that he had a uh, large overbite, which, uh, this is from his book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, which, which I find is a, a somewhat specious reason for, for uh, not admitting a fine uh, candidate into the Naval Academy, but nevertheless, uh, it was sufficient that uh, Bailey became uh, persuaded to um, go to the uh, uh, Admiral Farragut Academy uh, for preparatory and then Worcester Polytech uh, for engineering. Uh, for Bailey, actually, a very fortuitous turn of events uh, because he, uh, he had a very, very successful uh, career in manufacturing and used the engineering very well uh, to his advantage. When, when World War II uh, broke out, uh, the Navy determined that Bailey's overbite was not a sufficient reason uh, <laughs> to not press him into public service, and he served as engineering officer on very, very large ships with great distinction uh, as an officer in the Navy. Um, as I mentioned, he went into manufacturing in Western Mass. Uh, he worked for 30 years for a company known as Acme Chain, uh, rising through the ranks and becoming its president um, through a succession of, of transfers of ownership. Uh, Bailey remained at the helm and, and uh, steered, the, steered the, uh, the company to a, a very, very uh, major position in the manufacturer chain. Um, in 1978, he and his family returned to Egerton and purchased the home that uh, they now live on uh, in Lyndon and uh, 90 North Water Street, one of the great uh, gems of colonial architecture in every town. Um, his wife, uh, Phoebe, passed away in the 90s, and uh, um, I think Bailey would be the first to tell you that he was a very fortunate gentleman, and one of the more fortuitous things that happened to him was a blind date. Uh, uh, that he was set up with Joe and my Susie Whitmore. And uh, I will tell you that he was a very smart guy, so he pursued Joe and she agreed to be his wife. Um, Bailey served as a uh, board member and president of the Historical Society. He was Commodore of the Airtown Yacht Club and for many, many, many years the skipper of his beloved boat, Gemma. Um, I was very fortunate to work with Bailey in 2009 on the uh, transfer of the Martin Love House to the Preservation Trust, so he preserved for enjoying the future generations. Uh, truly a, uh, a life worth living. Uh, and so I'd like to invite Joan to the podium, representing Bailey today. Elizabeth, on behalf of the museum, uh, present to you this uh, very uh, wonderful honor for Bailey. Very sorry that he couldn't be here today. Um, he had some surgery about a month ago, he was progressing nicely, and then had a little blip, and uh, was advised not to go up today. So he, this is you all, and thank you very much for this wonderful honor. Well, we're reaching the end of the meeting, but I uh, would like to work just once more to give an opportunity if anybody has any questions at all on um, the rather remarkable year the museum has just passed. Uh, yes. I'd like to say one more thing. How I was in Denmark will talk. Thank you, baby North. He hired me.
And I want to assure you that I turn the gavel over to Sheldon Hackney, who shall succeed me. So we will go onward. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of Sheldon's favorite His favorite phrase is onward. So I, I know he will do a good job of that. So if there are no other questions, uh, you are all cordially invited back to the museum for a session. Chance to look at our new exhibits, uh, Isaac Stats and Us, and we would love for you to come and just have a moment to chat. And um, without further ado, we'll officially adjourn. Thank you very much.